Good evening and good afternoon and good morning to all of you who are joining us uh, from Hong Kong and other places around the world. Welcome. I see the, the number of attendees right now is 145 and keep going up. So it's wonderful to see everyone here. My name is Dorian Chung. I'm Ch uh, Deputy Director and Chief Curator at M+. It is a great pleasure to introduce the fourth and final session titled, It's Archigram as part of M Plus Matters Archigram Cities. This is the culmination of the multi-part online event, which began almost 10 days ago with the first session of the symposium in Habitations on November 4th, the second session Figurations on November 6th, and the third session Transmissions on November 10th. We have heard 11 experts' presentations on the methodology and influence of Archigram, um, and organized to mark the acquisition of the Archigram archive into the M plus collections. We hope Archigram cities has a served as an essential exercise to start recontextualizing and reinterpreting the work of Archigram, encouraging new dialogues between these globally influential figures and their counterparts in the region. As expressed in how we named tonight's event, it's Archigram will be directly engaging with the work of Archigram through a screening of two works from 1967 and 1972, followed by a conversation with the members, Dennis Crompton, Michael Webb, David Green, and Peter Cook, moderated by Eric Chan and Eunice Seng. Before I invite Eric Shulden Fry, the head of uh, a Department of Architecture at Hong Kong University to share a few words, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to all 11 speakers who took part in the last three sessions for their stimulating insight and provocations. I also want to thank Archigram members for their um, participation tonight and contribution in the form of highly engaging trash history slash theory, video response, and unabashed critique of the presentations. Lastly, I want to thank the organizing team from M+, Shirley Surya, curator, and Noah Chung, curatorial assistant uh, from design and architecture team, Eric Chan, a professor, professor of practice at Dongji University, Shanghai, and the former lead curator of design and architecture at M+, and from the University of Hong Kong Department of Architecture, um, in addition to Eric Shodem Fry, Eunice, Eunice Seng, Roberto Rakejo, and the moderators, Joshua Bolshever, Ying Zhou, and Zhu Tao. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. I would like to finally add that this first online M Plus Matters event will be further complemented and enriched by an on-site event on November 21st in Shanghai under the heading of M Plus International and co-organized with the Power Station of Art, in which the two works being screened tonight will be shown to live audiences and also followed by discussions between Archigram members and Chinese architects Li Han, Yong Chang, Liu Jiakun, Mayan Song, and Meng Yang. So with that, I'd like to pass the baton to Eric Schildenfrey. Thank you, Dorian. I have the expectation that the M plus collection will form this living archive one that allows generation of narratives and our counter narratives uh, that we've been hearing these last few days. And it's through really these collaborations such as this that we find that the means to position the work within the archive in a manner that doesn't type, uh, try to establish a form of solid ground, but one really that opens it up to further debate and further questions. So I find this collaboration between M plus, Hong Kong U and Archigram especially meaningful for through this act of debate, we begin to question what has already been provided to us as a historic context, and we begin to question it. So already, even before the building of M plus is complete, the archives are being fully utilized here before us, present in the world, not because we are standing before the drawings and images, but because there's this insistence that the work is to be discussed. When Lars Nefte, the founding executive director of M plus, arrived in Hong Kong, he embraced the challenge of building an audience for the museum, despite the fact that there was no building. For a lack of building offered this opportunity to reach out across the community, across Hong Kong, 
and Lars acknowledged that he had to build the presence of M plus in the mind of the audience. If there had been a building, the audience would simply arrive. They would congregate together within the building. Without one, the concept of M plus is generated through placing work across the city and through debate. So I feel that same challenge exists and has existed for Archigram, that initially with no tangible building to visit, the work gained impact through reaching out, actively reaching out across the entire architectural community, that the work became tangible through the dialogue that occurred. And now the building of M plus is almost complete and I anticipate the ability to visit the museum and the archives to come as close to our archogram pseudoloon as anyone can come. For there is something about viewing original work that one has only seen in reproductions or only on screens. It's almost like seeing a person alive in front of you instead of on Zoom. So as I mentioned in my introduction at the opening of the symposium, there is this dire need for this particular type of archive in Hong Kong, an archive of speculative work, for so much of the future cities that we are currently designing are mundane, lacking imagination and energy. We need to be challenged, to be confronted with what we are doing, and to be questioned and to be interrogated. And Archogram does just that. To examine the work is to be challenged by it. And to discuss the work, as you've seen throughout the symposium, you'll be challenged by the members of Archogram as well. So historians and theorists are placed on edge. And to be placed on the edge is painful at times, but I think it's rather necessary. So I'm very grateful for everyone who made this event happen. And it's an incredible pleasure uh, that we're all able to, to witness it, uh, despite the fact that these are times that we couldn't be in person. Is actually some ways through Zoom is a, another mode of trying to communicate when communication is so hard. So thank you again, and Shirley, off to you. Thank you, Dorian. Thank you, Eric, for a very thoughtful introduction and just kind of recalling almost what happened in the last three sessions up till now. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I'm Shirley Surya, Curator for Design and Architecture at M+. And thank you again for joining us for the first online screening of Archigram 1967 and Archigram Opera. So just wanted to say that this is almost like a one-off. After that, this recording will not include these two films uh, due to rights issues. So uh, again, um, whatever that we're going to see tonight is not a substitute. Uh, we would rather watch them live, uh, but we are also glad that by showing it on Zoom, we were able to kind of bring this to a wider audience. So before, I, before we present uh, Archigram 1967, I'd just like to, like to share a brief introduction on the two films. So commissioned by the BBC for a late night arts program, Archigram 1967 was the very first national broadcast of Archigram's work. And it, follows the, it followed the publication of the group's highly influential magazine. Uh, directed by Tattooist International, the film was transmitted on 19th January, 1967. In the program synopsis, the BBC described Archigram as, quote, a group of young British architects who believe that architecture in the space age means expandable buildings that can change when and as needed, end quote. Similar to the Archigram magazine, the film consists of montage of clips and imagery from the world of aerospace, manufacturing, biology, science fiction, pop art, psychedelia, and images of Archigram's projects. Archigram Opera, on the other hand, was developed in 1972 with Archigram member Dennis Crompton as lead producer. It is a 45 minute long multimedia projection of Archigram's work across 10 years of their activity and nine issues of their magazine. What we are seeing tonight is the web-based single screen version. Thank you, Dennis, for editing it to this uh, version that we could show online. It is a, originally a narrated projection of 644 slides, accompanied by the music of 1960s rock bands like Vanilla Fudge, The Grateful Dead, and Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Often presented as part of Archigram's lectures and exhibitions, it distills the group's thinking, intentions, and influences identifying with what Archigram once described as mobility, robots, dreams come true. Tonight, there'll be a slight change in the lineup. We'll first play the 16 minute long Archigram 1967, followed by a discussion with Archigram members, moderated by Ira Chen and Eunice Seng. After the first discussion, we'll then play the 38 minute long Archigram opera, followed by another discussion with Archigram. I also want to remind you to please enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. 
Thanks to the permission given by the BBC, we are now pleased to present Archigram 1967. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Eric Chen, as, as Dorian and Shirley mentioned, and I'll be moderating uh, the, the session tonight with uh, Eunice Seng. And I admit this was um, the first time I've also seen uh, this remarkable uh, video. And um, it's so great to have uh, Dennis, Peter, and uh, David with us. I don't see Mike yet, but maybe he'll be joining us um, a little bit later. But um, you know, uh, David, Dennis, Peter. I mean, what what one of the things that struck me about this this video just now was how um, much how much of it resonates with uh, with with our current moment. I mean, when you I mean, the the the, the video started off with this sort of a very strong statement that you uh, that Archigram was concerned about uh, our survival. Uh, it talks about how uh, the consumer is more of a participant than a target. It um, it it. Um, uh, it, it, it refers to cities as uh, being in the information business. These are all things that, that sound very, very uh, familiar to our contemporary discourse. At the same time, there, there maybe are some, uh, some differences that allow us to have, uh, that, that give us some room for reflection. Um, in, in seeing this through you know, 2020 eyes, uh, it, it really struck me, and maybe it's problematic that we are looking at this through 2020 eyes, but when you talk of, when the film, when the video talks about um, uh, you know, the notion of expendability and the kind of disposable culture that was emerging uh, at that time. Uh, it, it, it talks about it in a way that embraces uh, disposability and expendability uh, in embracing change over permanent. Uh, it, it, it would be nice to sort of hear you guys at some point tonight reflect on, on this video, seeing it through your uh, 2020 eyes. But maybe let's, let's start off by going back to uh, the time in which this was made, you know, the the, the swinging 60s. Um, clearly this shows, this sort of manifesto of, 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 of sorts uh, via this video uh, showed how clearly you were drawing from the popular culture uh, of that time. And yet, after this video being brought on national- Before channels, you were born, Eric. Right? It was, it was made before you were born, probably. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to say yes, we can still say that. <laughs> yeah, that, yes, I wish it, I could say that. I, I'm sorry I, I explained to Shirley I've got a lot of domestic difficulties at the moment. Oh. But, but there are questions there, that, that, like our idea of permanence must change. I mean, that's, you might see that in quite a different way now, imagine you, particularly your generation. And, and that buildings have no capacity for change. Well, no, they don't. Why should they? And the climate thing and the crisis, I think, changes everything, doesn't it? Well, the, the okay. the but it's, I think it's the style as much as anything. Do you think it's it's very kind of in your face sort of film, isn't it? Do you think? Anyway, I'll shut up now. <laughs> well, I think I think that the style, it's a yellow who's sitting beside me, my wife has just said, you know, it's, it, it, it evokes the period very, very clearly, very mm. in, intensively, and the, even the, the, the fact it's black and white and it has this repeated sort of zzz, zzz, zzz thing, uh, it's, it's very, in, <laughs> to kind of phrase, it's very in your face. I think if were we making a parallel film now, it would be inherently less in your face it would, we would be using perhaps more oh, it's 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 uh, methods of, of communication uh, you know I think that that communication in general if we take the, the, the media if we take the, the, the personal media so it's much more insidious it uses every kind of nuance and wily thing there's that was saying you know this is what these guys believe and this is it. Same with in, in parallel. I think the question of of of, of um, expendability. Sure, one has now perhaps modified one's views on expendability, not just because it's fashionable to, but I would still say that there is a a, a, a quality of building action that hasn't really been taken on board. And I'm trying to think what word I would use. So I would call it modif modifiability, mod modability. So that, that the ability of things 
to modify. Uh, I'm, I'm just in, involved right now in, in, in making a building which seems still, though it uses some sort of uh, accelerated techniques, it, it's incredibly ploddy. The building industry is still incredibly ploddy. Things like, you know, not just panel prefabrication, but more sophisticated prefabrication is still treated not only by the public, but I think more by the building industry as suspect. And it's, it, the, you know, one of the statements that was made in the film was just flew by, said the acceleration of science. And I think, my God, in, that, in, in those decades since the film, my God, we, I don't think we even ever anticipated the degree of acceleration of science. But there are certain things, like if I take the, the Plugin University, which I, I drew, um, one thing that does occur, which is that you have this elaborate arrangement of university buildings, however you design them. And the irony is that in, 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 in the years since I've actually been involved in doing some university buildings, which don't remotely look like, like that thing. But uh, what does happen in it is the suggestion that, first of all, you have lots of people sitting in rooms in the days when we enjoyed sitting in rooms. And then this, this agency becomes more and more important. And here we are actually living that. It's as if the, th the thing existed and, and we're all sitting in different bits of bubble on the top. And then that housing can use the expensive facilities that were created to make that possible and, and take it over. And then of course one thinks forward that perhaps even that metamorphoses into something else. So I'm, if funnily enough, sitting here with the, the, the computer on top of my drawing board, I'm thinking, you know, the only way I can really comment on that film is to go away and do a drawing of what I think Plugin City would do now, I, I sort of vowed this morning to, to, to sit down and do that on, on paper because the only way, it's, it's, it's better than just chatting away. Uh, the other thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop for a moment, um, uh, maker of the film, Tattooist effectively was a guy called Dennis Postle, who had been the editor of, of art, the Royal College of Art magazine. And he was a very famous, I mean, I'd heard about him on the RCA grapevine long before he, he, he met us. And he had this reputation of being really quite a extraordinary editor. He, I remember one of the covers of ARC had, you know, had holes in it. It was as if the, 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 the magazine was trying to leap out through the paper. And I think that we are all victims of agencies, whether they are uh, heads of schools of architecture or radio, sorry, TV producers, or whether they're conference gatherers, we are all, we, 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 and so the, the discussion of what is the value of M plus and having the stuff in there, it is a, it is a trigger of a means to an end to, to continue the conversation of expanding architecture in whatever ways it should, it can develop. And I think, but on the other hand, that the, the nature of that editing, the nature of that platform is always terribly interesting to scrutinize. One says, yes, M plus is a slab-like building done by Herzog and Maron. Who are going to be the characters inside it who manipulate it? It's purely an instrument, it's like a camera tripod, no more, no less. And I think that uh, Postel, Dennis Postel, who with whom we had engaged, again, he's still, still around, but we engaged again, I think about 10 years later, when he gathered us and Cedric Price together to look at the 10 year, whatever date it was, the 10th anniversary of the building of, of Centre Pompidou. And that's some years down the line after this one. And what was interesting is to sort of say, right, you guys were throwing around the ideas that in, in a way led to this building. Now the building is 10 years old. What do you say now? I think. Uh, agencies or, or interpreters or editors like Postle. And I would say you, Eric, Eric Chan, who's sitting there, I, I've observed over the last few years, has that same ability to coax and to review, to coax and to review. And the, and the poor old guys who are sort of shooting their mouth off or drawing funny drawings or making funny museums, 
Um, we, we, it, it's the alchemy of, of ideas interpreted by others. So I think that's why some of our crusty remarks in, in, in the earlier discussions about you know, feeling as if we're being held by some awful tight academic thing, probably a bit over the top, probably a bit unfair, but it's, it's, a, it's a creed occur to say, use every means at your disposal to attack it, disseminate it, review it, get it to inspire other people. I think there are people sitting out there. I know there's some really weird shit Chinese architects, because I've seen some of the stuff they do. It, it, I want them to, to visit M plus ASAP. And that, as I said the other day, you should do stuff on the roof, in the garden, explode some of those rooms, make us, you know, I would love to see some, some mollusks, some, uh, some uh, awful, naughty, creepy, crawly things fighting their way out of the H&M building. I mean, that's just a sort of symbolic thing. I have to say, I am loving seeing the softer side of Peter Cook. <laughs> what a what a a nice uh, way to end the week. But um, thank you, Peter, for uh, for that. And um, but but maybe uh, along these lines, and going back to sort of that that period in in the '60s when this video was made, uh, I, I I think we're all curious to to know how this collaboration w uh, between uh, you guys as Archigram and and Dennis Possel, um, uh played out like like how much how much how much input did you have uh in the content of that of that video and what were some of the discussions and maybe even disagreements uh that you might have had in in, in how you presented yourselves or how you were presented yeah. uh, I, it, it was very it seemed very easy because i think you always in a, in a certain moment in history or in a certain sort of cultural bubble if you like he, he came from, as I say, from Royal College of Art. There were a lot of interesting things going on in the RCA at that time. And he was, he, he was prominent in this. And we were part of a certain like generation, certain kind of attitude. I think we were quite relaxed. He, at some point, propositioned myself and my then wife to, to, to use our flat as a, as a, a rostrum studio, instead of doing it down at the Beeb. That meant we got a bit of cash in hand. <laughs> we cleared the room, set up the things. The guys came and did the rostrum stuff. It was there in front of me. We, we were part of it. At a certain moment, there was almost no dividing line between Dennis, Dennis Postle and Dennis Crompton. Uh, you know, and, and, and I think we chatted fairly relaxedly. I mean, he was obviously on our side and he could communicate in ways that cut through how we could communicate. It, it, it didn't, I don't remember it ever having any, you know, we should show this or, or you know, that's too far gone. But I, I mean, I think others could comment on this. Maybe Dennis in particular, because he's, he's our guru on the com communication techniques. Well, I don't remember any disagreements at all. I mean, there's a discussion, certainly, that, that wrapped it up because Dennis Postle was not necessarily as as knowledgeable about the intricacies of the archigram work as we were, so we had to explain that. But he picked up very quickly. I mean, I particularly like that piece where he's showing slum buildings and saying less buildings can change; they become slums or ancient monuments. And that almost was a quote from probably from Ron rather than. I, I was very curious, um, Peter, and uh, also everyone else, when you say it, and we know that when it's in your face, do you recall any particular incident in terms of reception, like right away after the, the documentary was out? Like, were there any like moment in which you really felt that that whole in your face uh, happened? You know, like uh, whether it's from a student or... Well, yeah. oh, I think there's a certain sort of English thing where um, the people who don't like what you do tend to just not talk to you or not talk about it. Uh, and that goes from, uh, when I when we've quoted before in this in this gig that that uh, I think it was Ron Heron who in, introduced the notion this will upset them. Would do something, say, hmm, this will upset them. 
we knew who the them were. The them were all <laughs> people who disagreed with this pretty much, but but particularly a sort of the middle brow, chattering class, people who read the posh Sunday newspapers and kind of don't want things to, nonetheless don't, are smart, think they're smart, but don't want things to move. Um, I think there was, a, I think there were some backlashes on later uh, TV. I can remember one TV uh, event when I got slagged off by somebody who I thought was a friend, but that was, I think, some years down the line. Um, you're going to have when to we'd become, when we'd also become um, kind of not establishment, but established avant garde, if you like. And that's a very funny role. I mean, uh, if I can digress slightly, I think one of the, you showed some, sorry, you, the, the film showed some detailed drawings of space tiles. Now, some of those weren't drawn by us, they were actually drawn by people who drew in adventure comics, the American comics, which Warren Chalk very assiduously collected and then Ron commented on. And then they, and one of the things that interested me at the time is that they in turn were copying almost line for line material that had been produced in Germany in the 1920s by people who hung around Bruno Taut and appeared in a thing called Fröhlich magazine. Now this intrigued me as a sort of quasi-academic, which I am or I'm not, according to Mark Wigley. Um, that, that, that there were intentions and even the delineation of those intentions in 1920, reoccurring in the 40s, being regurgitated or reinterpreted by us. It's sort of rollover. I, I, I hesitate to say whether that has continued, but, but perhaps, you know, perhaps in, in now it, it's in the hands of film film people, filmmakers, as I think you'll have somebody on. Well, you know, uh, to, to, where, where propositions are not necessarily made by drawings. You know, I mean, tell us a little bit more about who the, who the them were, because, you know, your uh, archogram was explicitly about, um, you know, reacting against the, 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 the previous, the work of the previous generation. of Very work. nice chap kind of shuttered concrete and a bit of brick London architects who sort of hung around people like Sterling but hadn't got his talent. Um, sort of erudite but dismissive uh, critics. Uh, they were followed incidentally by a whole generation of later critics who have always sort of treated mostly female, I have to say this because it's accurate. Uh, rather sort of pious, hand on heart, but then most of them, interestingly, have disappeared from view. And, and of course, then they are shocked and irritated by the fact that, that, that uh, internationally, you know, different generations of kids come up who, who love it. And these people still sort of mutter between their teeth. I think, I think that's useful in a way, because if I read the literature of, of, of uh, 19th century British architecture, it was a constant battle between the romantics and the classicists and the establishment and some sort of nutty characters who go off to the edge of Wales and do something strange. I think there will always be a them, it, they, but in recent history seems to want to suppress that, 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 that you shouldn't disagree with that. You know, recent periods of uh, school crits and so on, all have to be rather kind, you have to be very nice to everyone, not slag off the person sitting next to you. Whereas there was this, in the 19th century and in the archogram period, I think that was necessary, it gives you a certain, certain, the angst gives you a certain drive. At least that was still the case when I was in school in the 90s. <laughs> um, I, on, to pick up on uh, personalities, as I was discussing with Eric earlier, uh, we thought that perhaps um, we're going to throw a few prompts of, um, of people uh, that um, you wish to kind of talk about that may directly or indirectly uh, inform what we saw or beyond. So maybe I'll start and Eric can pick it up. Um, Smithson's or Price? The oh, or price. Price. But well, what against or for? Well, um, you can int uh, it can be both. 
Uh, it's very, Smithson is a very difficult case because I, 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 as a provincial, admired the Smithsons incredibly, like I was a, a real fan at distance. I was then taught by Peter Smithson. There was then a sort of slightly uncomfortable period when we started getting very well known, and I think the Smithsons sort of didn't like that. And then, uh, strangely enough, Alison Smithson became more friendly and Peter still, I think, retained a certain, I mean, he would call me, even as a student, a Mickey Mouse architect. But he didn't realize how Mickey Mouse I might <laughs> actually become. Uh, but it's, it, I still regard them as, you know, in, in the UK situation, very simply. Sterling, the guy with the formal talent, love him, hate him, love it, I hate him. The Smithsons with a certain international sort of arrogance, almost derived from Corm. And Cedric, philosophically, and, and also a rather good artist, I mean, in a curious way. He's... So those are the three figures. And as endless, one can have endless conversations around it. Uh, you know, I think the other two were, 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 were wary of, of Cedric as well. And Cedric and Sterling had once had the same girlfriend, which is just, I just throw in for added cultural colour. Uh, and the Smithsons were quite pious, and they were sort of, half of them felt like the Eames, and the other felt almost like Northern Presbyterians. And blah, blah, blah. But this is too long a conversation for this event. It's, it's worth a discussion with others as well over a long, but it's is my simple explanation of the architecture culture of the end of the 20th century, mm -hmm. the middle end in in UK. Mm. How about um, how about Japan or California? Oh, uh, in the end, Japan just because I'm so pissed off with America at the moment. Uh, but uh, Japan is far more cute and imaginative and far more similar to the UK in its thinking. The J Japan has its, has its official sort of old culture, which everybody sends up. It has its eccentrics, it has strives on the left, it has its damp, it's tight. It, it, it enjoys ridiculousness, it likes stupid, stupid jokes, vicious jokes, vicious humor. Uh, the American, it's all, it has to still, you know, it's, uh, it, LA is great, but America is, is less and less interesting. Uh, Dennis, color pencils or rapidograph? Oh, I don't use either. <laughs> Peter's the colored pencil man. I mean, repeater graph, yes, because it's very accurate. Colored pencils more suit Peter's sort of broad, broad board approach to, to drawing. Not that he's not very, very good with a repeater graph, but he enjoys the colored pencil. But he should tell you that, not me. <laughs> I just have to take the photographs. Or how about Mike? What's your response to that? Your your well, color pencils always look streaky when you apply the color. You can't get it smooth overall, and yet lots of people have, and I don't know how they do it. Perry Culper says you apply a bit of turpentine to the color pencil mix to get smoothness, but Peter's raising his finger. You spray it to with you add spray a little gel. You spray it after, you do it very intensively till your arm almost falls off. And you have to use uh, the, he the American ones, you have to use these Prisma colors, and you do it into the thing. And oh. then you spray it and it becomes like a flat paint. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Eunice, I think you had some, uh, some, some more serious historical <laughs> questions that, that you wanted to... Well, I had a list of personalities, but um, uh, I'll just throw them out and then we'll see how we are with time for questions from the audience. Um, Fuller or McLuhan? 
I'll Marshall McLuhan. Minster Fuller or Marshall McLuhan. Fuller, Benham or uh, Martin Polly. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'll stop there. Uh, Raina Benham or Martin Polly. Uh, uh, is Polly your contemporary or a little bit younger? Martin Polly. Um, Raina Benham. A little bit younger. Younger. Um, we were curious because uh, Benham featured a lot, uh, and even in here, the house is not a home. His most famous quotable quote in all architecture schools. Um, how, how do you engage his uh, him? He lived across the street. Right. <laughs> and we go. We used to go to his place every Friday. And all sorts of amazing people used to pass through on his Friday night, on their Friday nights, Mary and Peter. Uh, I met, you know, the Eames several times, the Smithsons were regulars, Cedric was a regular, uh, everybody from Conrad Batsman downwards, upwards. Yeah. So it's more kind of uh, uh, college, social collegiate. Yeah, but then the intellectual. Became, became, he was our apologist, really. Martin Paul is different generation. I remember you and I, Peter, going to interview him somewhere in a very dark flat somewhere in King's Cross before mm. he came to study at the AA. And he did that project, was it National Theatre or National Film Theatre project that was in Archie Ground 5, I think, which quite a brilliant project. But he, he was always a very prickly sort of character. Whereas Bannon was not. Byron was always a very gentle, might be insistent, but gently insistent. Whereas Paulie was very much in your face. Right. That's interesting. Paulie did triangular stuff. All his, that flat, if you remember, Dennis, I, I remember it too. Black and white, it was triangular. All the carpentry. Yeah. And then his schemes were triangular. And then I remember being on a jury of his as, when he was a student. It was still triangular. Then he stopped drawing for some reason. <laughs> we started writing, I suppose. We started writing, yeah. But both were very witty, weren't they? And I loved it how Martin Pawley once said of me, uh, Mike Webb looks like he's up from the country for the day <laughs> to be in the city. And uh, very, very amusing man. Why would he say that? Well, because I did, I suppose. <laughs> I imagine a pitchfork in my hand and the straw sticking out of my mouth. A country hick. Well, I, I'm going to... Uh, a rube. <laughs> I'm, I have a question that I wanted to ask earlier, which is on... Uh, in, early on, in, um, uh, there was this statement about survival. What uh, was survival in the context of 67 for you? Uh, because that's not, uh, I think it wasn't, it's not really a first time. Uh, Fuller said that uh, earlier as well, and he had a survival kit. So what was um, survival? Was it boredom or, you know, was it, the, was it professional survival or what, what were you, what specifically was that in context? was still in brackets human race you know I think even then you know it wasn't probably as, as universally discussed as now but it anybody was sort of discussing what you did you'd eventually discuss you know what its role what role it played in human development and one I don't know whether we were smart in, smart enough at the time to foresee that things would get even more and more difficult with population explosion. And that was before climate was being discussed. Just in, in a, a tail piece on Martin, I did actually bring him to teach with me a few years down the line. So I couldn't have been very <laughs> against him. 
Yeah, no, I mean it's it's interesting to hear you to, to hear you all sort of reflect on 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 uh, this notion of of, of survival, um, because as you uh, might remember and 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 as you pointed out, one of the, uh, one of the I guess critiques of of, of archigram was was that it was uh, let's say apolitical. Um, it was an, an apolitical kind of uh, well, what we would, would now call kind of a neoliberal. Uh, um, bourgeois uh, experiment, and 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 you guys were 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 very um, uh, you know uh, very skeptical of of that claim. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like like looking back on it now, I mean, to 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 what extent do you think? I mean, one can make the argument that that nothing is is apolitical, right? But uh, and, and and I know that this is a conversation you guys have um, have been. Confronted with, you know, since the 1960s or since since uh, since the 1970s, um, I mean, how has has even the notion of a politics changed? Do you think, or, or our understanding of politics changed in a way that might uh, shed a different light on the uh, politicalness, if that's a word, of of Archigram during the period? Because it was the 60s after all, and of course we all know, you know, the 60s was a real time of of of, of tumult and 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 turmoil. <laughs> yeah, again, uh, I was always very irritated by the fact that once one started meeting the guys, particularly the French, I have to say, who were involved in the six and, we, and, and some of the key people involved in the, in the French 68 events were actually architects, some people who produced a magazine called Melpomme, mm -hmm. and they taught at UP6, and we had confrontations with them, both as Archigram and our students, with their students, so on. Uh, I was always struck by the fact that they were extremely bourgeois. I've, I've quoted many times that, yes, you could be a Marxist, but you seem to have a, a Mercedes parked around the corner. And, and uh, I probably more, I, it'd be interesting to hear David on this because um, I think he's in, instinctively more moral and more political than I am. I've always tried to claim that I'm non-political. Only, only Brexit, I think, is the first time I've, I've felt really consciously political. Um, I think uh, may, mainly to do with the sorts of people who were most political. They always seem to be tiresome and shrill and downbeat and oh my god I want to tell you yes may even if I agree with you go away and shut up. Now I think we um, Peter we know you have to run uh, fairly I have soon. To do a lecture now in a minute yeah. Yeah, so uh, and, but, and uh, infiltrate uh, yet another generation of, of people with horrid ideas. <laughs> well, before we let you go and uh, continue on to the Archigram Opera, after which uh, we're, we're lucky to still have Dennis and, and Mike, and, and, and hopefully David will come back. Um, we, we, we did want to sort of ask you uh, a bit, uh, you know, uh, about Japan, because that, that's something that, you know, we have um, looked at in particular uh, throughout this uh, symposium, both with, um, uh, with Tsukamoto, but also the, the, the paper on, um, uh, and, but also your relationship with, with metabolism uh, and Isozaki. Uh, of course, Isozaki was not formally a member of the metabolists, but he was uh, uh, closely associated with them. Um, what what uh, you know you you just now said that you know uh, you, you just now chose Japan over California. Um, you know maybe tell us a little bit more about those first interactions and and please uh, Dennis and Mike if you want to uh, chime in please do. Uh, but tell us about your first interactions with with Japan because you were really working at right exactly the same time. Uh, how, how did you sort of discover each other halfway around the world? Uh, in um. the Days. Two, th two things. One, one was, I think, more important in a way was the personal thing, the interaction with Arata Azizaki at, at the 68 Milan Triennale. You know, we were in the same hotel for two weeks and we got chatting. And then uh, the fact that Ron and I taught alongside him and the three of us taught a, 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 a studio together in, in, in UCLA. And uh, as I think I said the other day, that um, I used to spend every second day in his little beetle car and we'd go working our way through David Gebhardt's uh, architecture of Southern California, very, relig very religious, like two students. 
And you imagine the number of conversations we're having as a, you know, discussing a third party architecture between us. You get to know each other very, very well. And so seeing him in the years in between quite a number of times, mostly in Japan, but elsewhere, uh, it's like, you know, carrying on an old friendship of, of conversations. As I said, you know, we, were, we, we got off with each other and we amuse each other. And we kind of can dig each other in the other and say, hey, come on, you know. That kind of thing. Now, the Japanese, I, I, I was not prepared until I went there for the exquisiteness of even Japanese crap, if you understand, that even a bad building is very interestingly produced. Even their sort of ticky tacky stuff, their drinks machines at the corner of every street. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's like the way that they decorate a table, how they prepare three sandwiches on a plate. You know, it's considered. But I think there is this, I have a s enormous respect for their, I mean, they're cruel, but they're highly creative. Whereas <laughs> the American, LA, yeah, the movie industry, perhaps, and it, what surrounds it is creative. And that's why it's interesting that schools like SciArt right now are becoming more and more. Uh, and we'll see, I think you've got Liam Young coming on later. And although he's an Australian, he he personifies that. The, the, and, and, and his, his boss, uh, Fernandes Alonso, really wanted to be a filmmaker. And the school becomes closer and closer to the degree of creativity of, of movie making, TV making. So that's the big plus of LA. And the fact it's full of more good creatives than almost any other city. But the, the kind of infrastructure of it, it's Americanness. It's 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 innate, surprising determination to have a downtown. It ends up looking like St. Louis downtown. You know why have a downtown? That kind of thing is irritating. So to Tokyo is still, and it's a degree of intrigue because, of course, in the end you can't speak the language, and, right. and maybe that accentuates the interest in it there's a sort of perversity there well along those lines i mean i and, and then maybe we should let you go peter and, and, and three uh, minutes program. yeah i mean uh, i was struck by uh tsukamoto of atelier bow wow's uh talk where mm -hmm. he uh, describes how you know as, uh, as a student of architecture he was uh, always uh, he always thought of archigram and, and, and metabolism, metabolism as being quite similar. But as he studied it more and more, and as he met, met you, uh, he realized that they, in some ways, had more differences uh, than similarities. Uh, at that time, uh, Peter, you know, in the 60s, what, how did you guys sort of see the relationship, the, the, the similarities and differences? I think they were a very interesting model because they were doing stuff or at least under Tangi's insistence they were doing stuff and some of the you know I don't know they were probably ahead of us on the capsule actually you know this is debatable but I think you know okay some of the French had been looking at capsules as well so this is a, another discussion but uh, they had it all pretty much wrapped up you know um, in a way that we were still disparate and I think we we had, as has been said several times now in this conference, we were six different individuals. You know, I want you to hear David on these subjects because he, he and I often don't have at all the same view of things. And, 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 but that's a creative thing, whereas I have a suspicion that metabolists might have been kind of knocked into line. But, but that may be unfair. I mean, it'd be interesting to discuss that with Izaki, actually. Yes. I have to leave you now, guys. Um, yeah, Peter, thank you. Uh, and uh, a conversation so far, but let the other hogs hog. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much. And we'll look forward to seeing you uh, via Zoom next Saturday. Uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. I uh, too. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Bye -bye. So, uh, Dennis and, and, and Mike, uh, thanks, thanks for staying with us. And uh, we're, we're, we're going to go move on now to playing the Archigram Opera. But Dennis, maybe, because uh, this was sort of your, your baby, you know, as has been said, maybe you can kind of set this up for us. Tell us a little bit about what, what prompted um, the, the creation of, of the opera and, and how, how it was used. Well, it, it started in the early 1970s. 
uh, Peter, Ron, and now uh, myself, with as well as being working on the on the Monte Carlo project, we're doing a lot of lecturing. Uh, Peter around the UK and Europe, and Ron and I mostly in the United States. In fact, Ron and I spent eight weeks traveling around the United States. And it gets very boring giving the same lecture three times a week for eight weeks. So we developed this technique of having a, a load of slides in trays and setting the thing going and just pressing a button when the next slide should come on with a recorded chat that was the lecture. Peter is doing the same sort of thing. And, and I remember I went to lecture to a student congress in Australia and finished off by doing exactly that, playing a pre-recorded lecture with two remote controls controlling the slides. And that then got automated because at the time in the 1971-72, there was very little ways of controlling slide projectors. So everything was just by a remote control that just basically closed the circuit. Now, earlier than that, I'd been working with the Light Sound Workshop at Hornsey College of Art, and it got quite a lot of experience of using tape recorders and slide projectors then. So I was able to automate the progress of the slides, but this carousel projector still was something that only would show one slide at a time. So we finished up using eight projectors and eight slides of trays that changed in the middle of the of the opera. And that went on for a little while. Then without becoming too boring about the technology, the technology developed so that we were able to automate it better. Then 15 years or so later, we were invited to one of the Santa Pompidou's celebrations of its 10th anniversary or something. And by that time, we were able to, to show the opera without us having to press buttons all the time. And that developed and when the Archigram exhibition started touring after starting in Vienna in 1994, it became a, a built-in part of the exhibition itself. So we would go out to wherever the gallery was, set it up, press the start button and go back to London. It just kept running for the next eight weeks. Now, more recently than that, in about five years ago, I suppose, we were able to actually digitize the opera. So the slide trays are all the sitting, well, one set is sitting in Hong Kong somewhere in a large box and another set is sitting on the shelf behind me. And when it's digitized, it's just played on two video projectors that replicate between them the four screens and the eight slides of trays of slides. So you'll see in the version that you're about to see in a moment, I had to then reduce the four screens to two screens to make it work on this sort of 16 by 9 proportion video screen. So it isn't, it's changed it very much materially. Because the thing about the presentation when it was in the exhibition, it was in a space we call the arena. And it was very much an immersive experience. Here it isn't going to be, it's just going to be you sitting where you are, wherever you're sitting in Shanghai, me sitting here in central London, other people sitting in Hong Kong, other people sitting, goodness knows where, all over the world, just seeing it as a television show. So it really isn't the same experience, but it's the same material. So hopefully the story that basically Peter is telling in the soundtrack to the opera will come over. And the soundtrack was made by Peter. There are on-screen captions some of which were made by Peter, some were made by David and others by Ron or myself during the course of the original presentation. But I've always enjoyed it. 
<laughs> now you've got, a, you've got an idea of what a techno whiz Dennis is, because when we did the Pompidou lecture, I remember the first slide was actually a giant screen wide spirit level so that you had the slides all perfectly horizontal. Never the case with Dennis of the slides tipping out of the carousel while being shown. Eh? All Great. right. Great. Well, on that note, uh, let's get started on this uh, special version of the Art Program Opera that Dennis has made for us, which is uh, going to run about 38 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. And then we'll come back uh, for a little bit more discussion and, and, and Q&A. Dennis, you know, as as you said, this probably doesn't. Uh, it's um, uh, it, it can't compare it to a, 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 an actual the, the actual immersive physical experience that it was intended to be. But this was still really pretty uh, amazing and, and mesmerizing. So thank you, Dennis, for, for putting that together. For this. Uh, it was incredible. Uh, Am I on? Oh, it was, uh, incredible images, but also words. And what I thought was great was there is, uh, well, among the many things was that there was a line that, that said, Archigram said, love my pictures, not my words. But of course the words were, were, were pretty, pretty fantastic also. And I know that's something David would, um, would, would agree with. Um, another thing I'd sort of noticed too was, you know, uh, going back to what we were saying earlier, uh, you know, Archigram is, is, is uh, known for being this kind of, uh, for, for being sort of relentlessly optimistic and yet, when you uh, look a little bit closer, especially with texts like the Ghosts and, Ghost and Phantoms, there is a kind of, I don't know if, if darkness is the right word for it, but it, 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 the, the, that optimism was sort of tempered by, um, by, by, by something else. Um, now, That's what well, Warren the Olympic standard pessimist. And he paired up with Ron Heron, who was Olympic standard optimist so between the two of them they made a more or less normal person mm. that was Warren's piece and Warren was always pessimistic yeah yeah no but that, that just reminds right. us that archogram is not one thing it was actually still six you know uh, uh, six people uh, with, yeah. with their own uh, uh, personalities and, and, and inclinations and so on uh, Eunice, I know you wanted to ask a question. Uh, oh, I have a whole bunch, but maybe to pick up, uh, uh, since you mentioned um, the letter to David, I wonder, uh, David, if you can talk about a bit about that and whether you actually responded to the letter with another letter or um, what was the, um, what did I, you do I with it? Because I've, I've only just come in. Oh, um, yeah. oh welcome back, David. That was a letter from... I, I'll back up. So, uh, David, there was a letter uh, in the opera. There was a letter from Warren to you in Ghosts yeah. and Phantoms. So I, I, I'm not... sure I probably did reply, but the, uh, Warren and I wrote, and, and also Mike and, and I wrote. Ah. I can't remember what I wrote. So this was co-written? Probably. I, I don't know. I'm... Um, my memory is very bad, uh, but uh, something struck me with the Mike's thing that dreams shall come true, and of course there's there's a very very nice um, Bob Dylan song that says if I can be in my dream, <clears throat> sorry if you can if I can be in your dream you can be in mine, but then of course one person's dream is another person's nightmare, uh, and I enjoyed uh, Eric's comment about this. The, the dark, there's always a dark side to optimism. <clears throat> and um, I know Peter would get very cross uh, if I said that. But, uh, yeah. I was not here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, maybe then on that but note yeah, uh, about that's music. Interesting, isn't it? The, op the, the, the optimism and the, dark, the pessimism together. Mm -hmm colliding because I think uh, for me the archogram was always a collision if you like I mean in a small way a cushicle is a collision between a cushicle and a vehicle and but in another way uh, the film particularly the, the graphics are collisions between it's a sort of collision between music technology architecture poetry and I suppose that's that, that would be something that I remember would recommend to students in a way now if you wanted to to 
to mix things up a bit more. Mm. So I'm not answering your question, am I? You are kind of, <laughs> but you you also bring up uh, uh, another question that I have, which um, it's been said in different ways uh, how um, architectural and even specifically your architecture um, is very much influenced by music. And here I think you put it really uh, quite uh, pointedly that it's a collision. So and uh, I'm I love your soundtrack obviously, and it's as Peter had said earlier, it's very specific to a moment as well. So I was wondering whether uh, any one of you would like to talk about that collision with music. What does it really mean when you say architecture is influenced by music in, in your case? You know, is it really the lyrics as uh, David had um, that then, uh, you know, that generated uh, the form that literally or something else? I'm sorry, Eunice, I got disturbed. Um, okay. Oh, that's fine. Maybe, uh, Dennis, uh, since the soundtrack is kind of your doing mostly? No, it's mostly Peter, actually. Oh, okay. I'll just put things together and those guys do all the, all the hard work. Yeah. I, 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 you, I suppose, Dennis, each of us would put together a different version, wouldn't we? You think? Probably, yes. But, uh, and so would Eunice would put together a different version if you asked her to. But I find that quite um, interesting. So then that brings me to the, uh, uh, the next question, which is relevant, probably, which is, uh, Dennis, every time uh, you have to put it together and re-put it together, and, uh, and this this whole act of continuously archiving it and exhibiting it, um, is it really uh, simply a format change or how do you actually see this? You know, is there a, a kind of need to also add things or, or is it important to keep it as it is in its 72 in terms of content or when you exhibit it say in the 80s, is there, um, do you update it? Well, it, it reflects the available technology of the various periods because it's happened over nearly 50 years. You yeah. know, it's not something I did a couple of weeks ago. Sure. So in the original format, if you can imagine Ron Heron and I traveling around the United States with these two very heavy suitcases full of 640 glass-mounted slides. And you turn up at some university where they've converted a, a basketball court into a lecture theatre and you've got white paper all around the walls and you sit in the centre with a pile of tables with projectors on them and these eight trays of slides trying to get everything in focus and lined up and everything else. And I remember one occasion when I was getting them lined up and I was fiddling about somewhere with one of the speakers, loudspeakers that is, and turning around and seeing smoke rising above one of the projectors because the fan had stopped and the slide was burning. All those things made it a much more immediate sort of event. Whereas now, because Eight weeks ago, probably, I was asked to compress the thing into something that could be shown as it has been just now on a single screen with a proportion of 16 to 9. It's, it has become very much tighter. There are lots of places, I mean, I've seen it more times than I could possibly remember. But when I look through it now, there are bits where I would like to open it up slightly but there are other bits where I'd like to close it down. But that's only possible because of the developing technology that I use in order to actually put the original back together. It would have had the same impression to the people in that basketball court in 1973 then because they were only aware of the video and audio technology of that moment it would have had the same impression then with, with its looseness 
because I hope it had the smell to all the 300 odd people who seem to be online with us, seeing it as just a part of a video show that they're very familiar with. They watch video all the time. Sometimes they're being entertained, sometimes they're being educated. But video is a very familiar medium for them to communicate through. So as it has changed over those 40 odd years, I've, I've changed and the way it's been produced has changed. And the um, audience changed. Well, some are still the same. David and <laughs> Mike are still suffering it. Mike, I, uh, we don't know if you saw, but uh, David was just saying hello to you uh, via a, a, sh a sheet of paper. Um, oh, no, I didn't see that. <laughs> David, do you want to show, uh, show, show Mike again? <laughs> well, um, may, may, maybe Mike, um, going back to this uh, sort of thread of pessimism that we can, uh, can, uh, can find in Arthur Graham's work, uh, it, it, it occurred to me um, uh, while seeing the, the opera, you know, we, we often think of your Cushical, your Cushical and Sudaloon, you know, as being a kind of, once again, a very sort of go-go um, optimistic project about, you know, infinite mobility and so on and so forth, this idea that you could carry your, your home on your back. But, but having seen, you know, the reference to survival uh, in, uh, in the Arcogram 1967 video, and then now um, uh, these other uh, kinds of uh, references i i wonder if we can see the 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 pseudoloon as sort of a survivalist pack now yeah well um david and i were teaching together in virginia in the mid 60s and there's a certain inevitable connection between the projects we were doing at the same time. So I think Krushikal is a different version, really, of rock plug and log plug and vice versa. And uh, I always wanted to tell David, I never have, he's gone. Um, never mind. Um, Back, it seems. That, that what he should have done, one drawing should have been a uh, reproduction of an image by Claude Lorraine, of this untouched paradise of young people disporting themselves in the meadow, having a damn good time. And somehow that should have been, I, you, you were out of the room, but um, I, I talked about the ideal rock plug, log plug project as being reproduction of Claude Lorraine with added figures which is very similar to your doily drawing, but it evokes that nostalgia for a, a wonderful world before buildings came along. And there was that thread running through our work that everything would be fine in the world were it not for buildings, mm. you see? Yes. Which is very Cedric Priceian in a way. You know, when he does a composition entry for new buildings and what he does, contrary to his cohorts, is to remove buildings rather than add them. And I think Rock Plug and Log Plug and Kushikal both were about the removal of architecture. Architecture mm -hmm. is what got in the way. And once you've got rid of architecture, you're okay, you're back in the world of Claude Lorraine. Mm -hmm. do, you think, do you think, would you agree that, agree? Or? I, I, yes, you put it much more eloquently than I could ever do. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> or even Claude Lorraine, yes. Oh, my ah, when, when it's raining, when it's Claude Lorraining in London, Ah, oh, there we are. <laughs> yeah, but it's not, it's not, it's not rain now, it's the virus that's <laughs> raining on us, or, or the illusion of it. And we don't yes. Mm. yes, quite. Uh, next question. <laughs> oh, so on that note, Mike, uh, you are Norman <clears throat> Jones, right? So, uh, did I get that right? You are Norman Jones, right? I was just wondering... Um... Oh, no, any connection between fictional <laughs> characters and myself is purely coincidental. 
I mean, you are the voice of Norman Jones, so. But this was, all, yeah. I mean, if we couldn't have a Claude Lorraine landscape, then we have everyone up in the sky flying around, riding. I mean, there's always that feeling in a plane when you look down on a cloud, how, how to sink gently down onto it would be a wonderful, soft experience. Well, uh, the actuality being somewhat different. I noticed that we are, are actually uh, running over already, um, but we do have a few questions. Uh, maybe for the, in, the in the interest of time, I can just quickly summarize them. Uh, one question, for example, is about, uh, I think it, uh, it basically says um, uh, uh, that, you know, you guys talk about flexibility and capacity, but not beautiful, uh, and not, but not beauty. Uh, and maybe uh, a response to that could be just referring to the uh, the text in the in the opera where it says um, a building under construction is more beautiful than when finished, and and, and maybe that um, uh, that's a, a very nice uh, su a summary of that. There's also a question about how your ideas have evolved, uh, and given the global environmental and waste crisis, um, I, I think Peter had sort of addressed that uh, earlier um, uh, <clears throat> uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, kind of perhaps rethinking what you know uh, your your positions on expendability and, and disposability um, now uh, versus versus then and then there's one final question uh, that goes um, as you said buildings have not changed in the past years but cities have changed in the way we use them uh, and maybe Dennis this is a question for you perhaps being the author of of, of the network city. Um, uh, or the computer city. Uh, do you see parallels between your your utopian city of the future, where the buildings are actually changing to what is, <laughs> and the new information technologies that make it possible to use parts of the city on demand, like Uber, Airbnb, and uh, WeWork? There's a technique that speakers or people like myself use when they ask the question is to answer a different question, which is the one that we wish you'd ask. <laughs> the truth about not just the computer city, but all of Archigram's work was that it was designed to be responsive, to be responsive to the people who were allegedly going to benefit from it. Now that overrides the basic concepts of expenditure of permanence of structures and so on, and waste and throw away and so on. What we would encourage or what we were encouraging was designers and architects like ourselves to develop systems which answered both of those questions. It's not that you discard something because it's useless, it's you adapt it to become useful again. And architects in general and urban planners and city planners of whoever else have not yet addressed that problem. We see, I, I mentioned the other day, Hong Kong and the walkway system there. Now the walkway system has evolved over the last 20 years, presumably in response to the movement of pedestrians through the city and the need for those pedestrians to avoid crossing roads where there was heavy road traffic. That's fine, but as the use of the city changes, will those pedestrian ways be able to adapt and change? I looked, when looking for the, the pedestrian ways, uh, researching them a few days ago, to see if there was a, a, an app for the mobile phone that, like I can, in, using Google Maps, I can drive my car from anywhere in the world to anywhere else in the world, being instructed constantly by Google Maps, turn left, turn right, carry on for 36 kilometers or whatever else. What would be interesting to know, and it may be that it's there, is if in Hong Kong, there are apps that pedestrians can use when they're following the walkways in order to get to the place that they wanted to get to. Now, if there were such an app, you can imagine the situation where the flow of pedestrians is being monitored by the, by the city or by the app 
and so that pedestrian ways might move in position in order to meet the changing flows and changing needs of the pedestrian. A bit like as a, I've seen in Harry Potter, where the staircase is, where the kids are moving between classrooms, the staircases in the main hall of the school there changed position. I thought it was a wonderful bit of, uh, bit of um, animation. But can you imagine that in the city like Hong Kong or like London or anywhere else, that the pedestrian routes were responsive to the flow of pedestrians. One thing that has happened in the last few years in New York is the way that the that upper level railway track that went from 14th Street up to 32nd, 36th Street has become a pedestrian route and pedestrians use it. When I first went on it, when the first section was open, there were very few people up there. Now, if you go on it, it's on a warm, sunny day, it's crowded with people following a route. They're not walking up Fifth Avenue or Seventh Avenue. They're walking up the High Line in order to get from Lower Manhattan to Mid Channel. Great. Um, I, I think we should point out quickly Dennis's background um, of, uh, <laughs> of of uh, of 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 archigram sort of superimposed on uh, uh, Hong Kong, in, in particular the the West Kowloon skyline, and. I, I, I think, uh, Eric, you know, if I could, I'm sorry to interrupt you a minute. If, if I could put an, another view that, that Mike has presented, you see, that the background should not be that, it should be a Claude Lorraine. In other words, the, <laughs> it's a pastoral landscape that we aspire to. I, I only put that as, as a question because, in a way, Archigram contained these very conflicting elements, I think, on the one hand, a desire for a, an architecture that didn't exist or only existed quite temporarily. And then it kept drawing this other architecture that was always there. And this is always something which has um, confused me in a way, or, or enjoyed about the, the, the fact that within Archigram there are these conflicting ideas, or not necessarily conflicting, but um, coexisting ideas, which, which for me is quite interesting. And I think something that may be, it, it's like it, archigram is not very modern in a way. Modernism was do this, wasn't it? But, but archigram is sort of not, it's like both and, it's not one or the other. It's like, how can these all different things collide? So I, I don't, and maybe it's not very clear, but I think, you know, if Dennis, so if I had Dennis's ability, I might constantly change that background, you see, flipping from one thing to another, from the, 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 the ideal of the Cushical or, or Claude Lorraine through to something which is much more, anyway, I'll shut up. Good. <laughs> no, that's that's really great, David. Uh, but I, I think we, we probably are uh, out of time. And and I but but if I may, you know, I've I've been spending a, a lot of time with Archigram uh, in the I guess seven years now since we first started speaking about um, bringing the archive uh, to M plus and uh, just the 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 number of uh, the, the number of revelations I I, I continue to to have uh, even from just uh, tonight I think. Uh, at least for me personally, points to the the, the, the incredible richness um, of 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 your work. Um, uh, sorry, Eunice, did, did you want to? Yeah, I uh, sorry to interrupt, but there is a qu question which I think would be a good one uh, to take as a way to uh, close. There is um, uh, one of our audiences uh, would like to get um, your thoughts uh, from each one of you. If you were to uh, fast forward and address uh, the context of uh, the urban conditions of today and uh, anxieties now over technology and environment, which of your ideas or techniques would you particularly encourage students to engage with? You know, if you have to specifically point to one, can we hear from each of you as a good way to, and, and then I'll hand over to Eric. 
that that's too much of a question you know <laughs> yeah you should tell me you're 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 young oh you know? well you tell me what what if if the, what would you what might you take from it you could say to me i take nothing at all you're a bunch of baddy uh, fascist bourgeois <laughs> <laughs> entertainers well, for me, it'll be a whole lecture. Say, so what I really <laughs> enjoyed is that you did this. You, t we talked about or the tattooist earlier. How you tattoo your brain? And if, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I can't speak for my colleagues. I think it's up to you to to take from it, what, like any book or film or poem or opera or piece of music. Yeah, or, or any aspect, you know, like, um, say for in, in Mike's case, like what would be um, a kind of updated thinking through the crucial, for example, like I, fr from your point of view, or, um, uh, you know, and um, like I point to earlier, David, you, um, of, of everyone, most, uh, I'm most interested in your proletariat stance or maybe I'm, I'm not sure I'm reading it right like your reference uh, to the blue collar worker like some kind of way to uh, think against the bourgeoisie and someone earlier in the audience said that actually he doesn't even agree that uh, Britain has a bourgeoisie he says it's all royalty but uh, so <laughs> Sorry, Britain doesn't have bourgeoisie just royalty it just, uh, this seems like it's going into a... <laughs> <laughs> so, no, um, that's not the direction we're going, but um, uh, just kind of a parting, like, if any. All right. So, so, so what, what do you, you give to you, the students look, now? There's a, part, there's a Marxist critique and a feminist critique of Archigram, which we, we all know about. And maybe, is that the way you want to leave it now? Uh. There's a big feminist critique of Archigram that's could you uh, reiterate that again? The feminist critique? Mm. There yeah, is. What, what is that? Oh, no, not now, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I know there's a, in London now, there's a, there's a sort of Marxist critique of Archigram that it's bourgeois, it's um, white men, um, etc. You know it, don't you, Michael Webb? Oh, uh, grumpy old men. Grumpy old white men. Yeah. Old farts. <laughs> yes, that's a term. I don't know whether that would be translatable to Chinese. Old fart. <laughs> what is it? No direct translation. But, you, but Dennis I don't is know one. Whether Michael Dennis agrees that. It, for me, it's up to what people like you, Eunice, take from it or don't take from it or or throw it away or little fragments that you find uh, of, of, of use to your own culture. That, that, that to me, would be the most important thing. What, what you find in it, not what I find in it. Um, I will share you... Um in the next session, my long list of my takeaways. Okay, good. Yes, and that is a reminder that there, uh, we, uh, we all wish we had more time today, but fortunately we do have more time uh, next Saturday for the uh, fifth and final installment of this epic uh, archigram journey.